having technical difficulties. I got 50 minutes to the daily show. Is that Jackie? That was
So this is kind of the overall environment. Now I'm going to switch to rice and talk very quickly about the entering uh, class. <coughs> if you do a 10-year time frame to, a, to kind of get a sense of one of the things that's changed about rice. Rice is actually, in many respects, of course, the same institution we were 10 years ago. I like to think in some of the most important respects, the role of colleges, for example, and life on the campus is pretty similar to it was 10 years ago, a very different student body than we had 10 years ago. And I think what's good for us is um, the number of applicants has doubled. We've become more selective. When we started the expansion, the question was, would we be able to maintain student quality? Would we, would we be able to maintain the diversity of the student body? The truth is, at the end of the day, we increased both of those. And part of that was the success generating more applications from across the country and across the world. The bad news is it's getting harder to get in to rights. As I told the alumni, did anybody know what the Groucho Marx problem? Do you even know what the Groucho Marx was? No. Right? The Groucho Marx problem, what Groucho Marx said is he wouldn't want to be a member of any club that would accept him. Right? So I told the alumni we've solved the Groucho Marx problem because we would no longer accept you. When you're applying for us. And so Rice is becoming more difficult to get into. And there's some good things about that. Next. So here's a breakdown of the entry class. This entry class, two attributes compared to recent classes, and no two classes are the same. We do not have quotas of any kind in our class. Generally speaking, this year's entry class was a little more Texan than the previous classes. I'd say. We've been averaging more around 45% in terms of number tech of Texans, and partly because of a big increase in yield, uh, very much more international than the prior classes. So when we admit the students, we have to make our best guess about what percent of those students will come. Now, it's the only industry in which you have to apologize when too many people show up to consume your product. Right? So I apologize. I'm sorry. My mistake. Uh, but particularly on the international students, a big increase in the yield. I think uh, on students from the People's Republic of China, I think the yield was something like 58%. And so that explains a little bit what the class looks like. If you just look at the Americans in the class, that gives you a sense of the diversity of the class. Now, for several years, the Rice class has had no majority in it in terms of the entry. Too. And those numbers change, again, that's a one-year picture. Those numbers change pretty significantly from year to year as we look at you know, the African pool. <coughs> Next slide. That's very interesting. <laughs> <laughs> let's try another one. Okay, let's do a bit. Yeah, slides if you're interested we have some questions about what are students you know the sort of majors the schools that students choose coming in and then how they end up majoring once they are here and those numbers are pretty different we can talk about that later uh, I think one of the things that everybody I know who's associated with rice values is the accessibility and affordability of education basically that if we admit students they are able to enroll the diversity of the student body. Again, you'll see numbers go up and down in part, again, because of the increase in international students in the most recent year. As an overall percentage, there are fewer Pell Grant recipients. We, of late, tend to be, in uni for universities like us, that is elite private research university, we have among the highest percentage of Pell Grant recipients. Uh, we have our, what we have maintained, we didn't go back on the policies we adopted, such as no loans for students from families earning under $80,000. A lot of our students get financial aid. And our tuition remains about, depending on the comparison, somewhere between five dollars to $8,000. There are a couple universities, Princeton and um, Caltech, that have gotten closer to us. We're still the least expensive in that group. Uh, but generally, we're a pretty substantial amount. But my goal is to make sure that after four years, the difference in the cost of our education versus theirs is at least the cost of the car. Uh, had a very successful centennial campaign, raised $1.1 billion. And if you're like everybody else, you're asking, where's my share? 
Um, that goes to a lot of different things around the country. This gives you some ideas. Uh, over $100 million for scholarships, the vast majority of that for undergraduate scholarships, new programs, research facilities, all the improvements you see around the campus, uh, new colleges, Surbury, Wilson House. On the bottom of the screen, it's a total campaign, the alumni giving rate was 60%. Uh, for fiscal 2013, it was 31%. I hope you remember when you get out, this is one of the factors in U.S. News and World Report, and it counts only percent given. That's what it counts. It doesn't count how much. So if you write out a check for $10, that counts toward that. So I hope when you leave, and most of our students leave happy, just once a year, send in a check for $10, <coughs> and when you hit your fortune, just add a bunch of zeros to it. <laughs> <laughs> Capital projects and plan. What is that? There we go. So here's what's going on on the campus. Did the map disappear from the prior slide? Are you having trouble with the graphics? I think it's not showing you up there. Do you have the PowerPoint itself? Um, from the email?
and see, but we are actually now spending some of the money that the students allocated. And if you think about that, the money the students allocated, just think about the difference it made, right? That's what got us started to pay for, I think, the half or more than half of the OEDK expansion. That money enabled us to go forward on design of an art center, which enabled us to get a $20 million gift for the art center. Without that money that the students had allocated, it's not clear we would have gotten a $20 million gift. And then there are fields and other things that came out of that. The R so the RMC, we're now going through a stage of, I wouldn't quite say design, but a stage of looking at the programming that's actually needed. And what we're trying to determine is what kind of projects would serve the student interest the most, and what are the different levels of cost? Is there a $10 million project that would make a difference? Is there a $20 million project that would make a difference? Uh, or do, or would, it, would we have to spend $30 million? I don't know the answer to that, but the architects are going to be talking to students and others. We've selected the architects for this stage of the project, and we will be getting them involved in sort of working with students and working with the administration to basically scope out what an RMC renovation should look like. But I, I, don't, I don't want to overstate that. This is still very preliminary. We don't have money for the building yet, but we hope that this, this undertaking this phase will get us to the next phase of raising money. Uh, so where are we? I'm thinking this is uh, working on how to name things here. Uh, we've had now for about eight years the vision for the second century, which provides the overall sort of guidance plan for the university. Some of those things have been achieved. For example, we finished with the student expansion of the student body. There are no further plans to expand the student body. The admission, the, the fact that we had 980 rather than 950 students enrolled this year here was a mistake, unless you were one of those extra <coughs> students. <laughs> uh, and we will cut back in some way on enrollments next year. We have to look very carefully at what's better to cut back on <coughs> students who are in the freshman class or students who are transfer students. So because there might be some value of cutting back transfer students because when the larger class rises, they're creating shortages at that level rather than in the entering class. So we'll sort of work through that carefully. But there are other things that are less <coughs> farther along, things that are partly farther along. And so now what we're trying to a little bit is moving the, the vision for the second century to what we call priorities for the new century, which are, in effect, underneath the vision for the second century, but, but more precise than what you And so here, there are three broad categories of things we're trying to accomplish over the next uh, three to five years. One are strategic academic priorities, which I'll get to in a second campus in infrastructure and investments. And this is much less building. We've done a lot of buildings. We have still some building ahead of us that I just went through. But we really now have to invest in the campus infrastructure, make sure the campus, and that includes, by the way, the IT infrastructure. You have to more or less replace the IT infrastructure every 10 years. You know, I, I remember when it was promised that all this IT stuff was going to make everything cheap and easy. And of course, what it did was make everything expensive and more complicated. It's still all good, uh, but it's tremendously expensive, right? That is, we'll probably have to spend something on the order, we don't know yet, of $20 million to renew the IP infrastructure on the, on the campus. And then the third thing is making sure that we operate as efficiently as possible. And sometimes the students have driven demands for that. You know, take a room like this and other facilities on campus. We, want to be able to use that not just during the day, but also in the evening, make sure we're using all our facilities and our administrative services are as efficient as possible. We need to save, not only raise more money as we did, but we also need to make sure when we spend money as efficient as possible. So going to the um, next slide. So here is what we have kind of tentatively identified and still working on in terms of the uh, what we've identified so far is seven major priorities as we move into this next stage. And that's, by the way, not to say that we're going to ignore departments or things that don't show up on the slide, like athletics are not part of the priorities of the university. They're just showing up in somewhat different respects, and it might not map completely onto our fundraising priorities. But in terms of strategic academic priorities, these are really the seven things 
that are important to us. I'll give you a little detail, I think, on one or two of the next slide. So one is really uh, quality teaching and education. <coughs> and to some extent, this creates an overlap with digital <coughs> education opportunities. Lately, when people have asked me about this, and they say, is, how important is this to rise? Is it threatening to rise? What I usually say is the most important effect of digital education for RISE is going to be on campus. It's going to be what happens in your classes and how professors allocate their time with students. Uh, so, are some of you in flipped classes and things like that, right? So, so that's an example of kind of what we expect to look for in the future. We have a new center for teaching excellence. We have to both get more information out about what's going well in our teaching and what's not, and make resources available to people to improve their teaching. We have a faculty senate committee. Uh, we are members of this Center of edX and Coursera, and we have a new center for digital learning and scholarship. And one of the advantages for Rice in terms of the use of digital education off campus is it gives us a chance to project our reputation and <coughs> quality outside the university and around the world. We're constantly struggling with being a comparatively small university. That's great if you're on campus, but we want our reputation out around the world. So using digital platforms offers some of that opportunity to make things visible. It can also enhance other things, for example, study abroad. That is, if people can take a course that they need at Rice when they're abroad for a semester, then they can come back and not lose any time. So I think as you think about this, you need to think about both the advantages of this. <coughs> uh, this is just an overview of what our digital portfolio looks like. Rice is involved in almost every aspect of digital education. I think I'll go to the next thing. Uh, well, that's, that's my walkabout from, from last. Which uh, I have to say, uh, it was great. I had a, I had a lot of fun. People tried. Actually, I could make the locky. What I couldn't make was you know, that little fern pattern in the foam. I couldn't figure out how to do that. Um, but it really, really was for me a, a great opportunity to kind of see what goes on on the ground. Not, not to go to things that are just visible, to sit in meetings of student organizations. For example, I went to a meeting of uh, uh, Engineers Without Borders. I went to a a lunch or meeting with the Bible study group, all kinds of different things across the campus that ordinarily, frankly, I wouldn't have a chance to observe. Went, went down in the went down in the steam tunnels, uh, you know, as I said, visited the, the coffee shop. Uh, really just a, a tremendous learning opportunity. Went and went over to the to the sold sold whatever they sell over there. Um, <laughs> and I tweeted about it. Uh, and so one of our priorities on the, the, the previous slide is to really develop one of the things I set forth in the centennial speech, which you can um, read online, or you can even watch online. I haven't checked recently. At one point, I think it had 600 views, and the, the centennial spectacle had something like 30,000 views. So, so I, I know the place of my speech in the universe. <laughs> uh, but one of the things that, I, that we really kind of set forth in that speech was this idea <coughs> of being an entrepreneurial university. And we don't mean that in the sense of making money or filing patents and all that. But that can be a piece of it. But it really is about empowering people to make a difference in the world, to take their plans and their ideas and, and move it forward to impact. And that can occur in any of a number of kinds of activities or disciplines on campus. And so we're looking at ways that, that we can more effectively support that and encourage that in both, I should say, among both students and faculty and integrate it with educational opportunities. And that was one of the things, for example, going to the coffee house and seeing the real passion that people had for their experience in the coffee house and working in a coffee house. So that's just one example of what occurs all across the campus. The initiatives that students took in launching House Bar, which went really from, from nothing to a very substantial uh, operation in part because that is a group of the most effective beggars 
uh, that I own. Uh, and I, I employ very effective people to go out and, and raise money. But Al Smart really came along at a very opportune time. And we supported them in their endeavors. And that's going to be an ongoing conversation across the university of how we kind of integrate student activities into the educational experience even more than we're doing. Because what's happened traditionally in universities, including Rice, is a kind of separation of those things, right? There's student activities, and then there's the education. We have to figure out, figure out how to effectively connect those things to each other and empower people. That's, uh, and as I said, a lot of that is learning outside the classroom, uh, supporting students in internships, uh, entrepreneurial experiences, leadership experiences. We really want the highest possible percentage of our students to get out of the Rice education with this as part of their education. When people come to Rice, and if they, particularly if they pay the full, well, for all students, I should say, they, they really want to need to get out with not just what goes on in the classroom, right? You end up, after four years, whatever time you're here, as remarkably capable people because of the full range of opportunity you've had and how you exercise that opportunity. One of the things we're now exploring with the donor is a major gift to the university uh, in the tens of millions of dollars probably to support a kind of leadership education experience for all students. And we're trying to figure out exactly how that would work. That gives you an idea of the kind of thing that we're working on. I think we're close. Thanks. Uh, so uh, last year, as part of the centennial, this SA formulated its vision. I think that vision was very closely aligned with the administration and faculty vision. We try to keep that in, in mind as we work through our own priorities. At least for us, we didn't sort of say, okay, that was a nice document for the centennial. We try to keep that very much in mind. We know that the OFC renovation was one of the top priorities that emerged from that conversation. There are a few others, and we're happy to be reminded periodically of what those things are. And so this is how are we doing, and here are a bunch of rankings and stuff. And there are a bunch of world rankings, and in the, I, of course, shows the, the ranking in which we do best on. That's, that's a way to approach rankings, and so I, I like the one that had us number one. If you look at global rankings, there are a sort of uh, three sort of reasonably well-known great global rankings. We rank, uh, I think it's 75, 92, and 136 in the world, or three other global rankings. The big difference for Rice is how much they count, or how much they take into account the size of the university, right? If they don't take the size of the university much into account, we tend to do not so well in those rankings. Uh, the ranking which we rank 75 in, for example, we rank better in because they take size into account, but they only take size into account for 10% of the ranking. This ranking of the of the Staff of Sciences and Engineering, it's actually the ranking of research impact based on citations for publication. And so one of the reasons we do really well in that ranking is that it's per publication and our faculty is really good and what they publish gets a lot of attention. Uh, we did go down slightly in U.S. News and World Report. We're kind of looking at that, trying to kind of understand U.S. News and World Report for things that are pretty confusing about it, such as uh, one of the big factors in it is what they call graduation rate performance, which compares your actual graduation rate to your predicted graduation rate. And so we're trying to figure out why our predicted graduation rate is higher than the predicted graduation rate of some of our peers, right? So our gradu actual graduation rate was 92%. Our predicted graduation rate was 94%. It's that difference that matters on that particular factor. One of our very close competitors that has a student body that looks a lot like ours in terms of academic characteristics, a little less diverse than ours, uh, particularly socioeconomic, their predicted graduation rate was 92%. So they did much better in the ranking on that criteria than we did, even though we had the same actual graduation rate. If that's confusing to you, welcome to my world. <laughs> uh, so you guys can use some other rankings. 
Uh, we do take the Princeton Review rankings. They're not overly serious. It's one thing. We have some other sources. When you graduate, you actually have to fill out a survey. We look at that and see how people are. Did they, did they like their major? Did they think the teaching and instruction was good? What else can, what can we learn from people as they exit that would help us improve? Uh, I think we have, on this set of things, as good you know, in, t in terms of student happiness, how they feel about the university, good and how they feel about how the universities run, whether or not the diversity of the student population is something they actually experience in their everyday lives by in terms of their relationships with people from different backgrounds with them. All of those things, even some surprising ones, uh, I think our students are, by disposition, I think our students are grateful for the things that they have, which is why we do very well in athletics facilities, even though some of our athletics facilities are not what we would want them to be. Uh, health services, we always want the health services to be better. But the truth is, at the end of the day, our students, I think, appreciate what they have. Maybe there's an element of sort of Southern or Texas, just good disposition in those rankings. Uh, that said, we take, we take some pride that this is what our students say. These rankings, unlike US News, which is just based on a formula and looks at certain kind of data, these are based solely on student service. But don't worry that we go back and say, Pop, we're just doing great. We don't have to do anything. We get a lot of attention. Am I worried that we fell from number one in happiness to number two in happiness? No, I'm not worried about that. <coughs> Candidly. Uh, but I think we do want to understand what all the different sources of potential dissatisfaction are. And some of that results to clout, crowding in certain parts of the curriculum, for example. I mean, places where we need to increase faculty numbers, particularly, for example, in the social sciences, we know those ratios aren't what they need to be in some of those disciplines. So we're looking at all that. And I think maybe that's it. I like this. And this is just my unsubtle way of telling you you should be following me on Twitter. <laughs> I'm going to stop there. I hope I left some time for uh, some questions. Was <laughs> <laughs> it something I didn't answer that you wanted me to address? <laughs> the expansion of the student body, we housed about 70% of the students on campus. Right now, we house about 75% of the students on campus. So we actually are housing more of the student population now with a larger student body than we did before the expansion. Uh, that said, I don't personally believe 75% is the ideal number. I think the ideal number for us is probably around 80% or a little bit some students are going to want to live off campus. Now, I have to say, I've gotten different views from students. Sometimes I ask students what they think, and they've said, don't add more housing because I think it's really good for students to have to live a year off campus, and everybody should have to, have to do that. So I think there's a little bit of range of views, but I would rather come closer to satisfying the student demand. Uh, the way we would do that, and when the students saw me about the pressure a couple of years ago, they asked students about how they would do that. And I think the students in the administration agreed on that, which was that we would somewhat ex expand somewhat, as we did with Will Rice, for example, the, the housing for each of the colleges. That is, we wouldn't build a new college to say move from 75 to 80 percent of the, of the population. At least at that time, <coughs> that was what the students thought, and that's also what the administration's thought. So the plan would be, as we have resources, to do that with some other colleges. Bill Rice, I think, added uh, 70, 70 beds, or I forget how many exact how many beds there are. It might have been a little less. But we would look at some other colleges. Uh, eventually, we have to decide what to do with the Sidrich Tower. And uh, we need to build um, a new commons eventually for Sidrich and for, that, for the survey. So we have to look overall at what. what <coughs> That configuration should look like. There's, there's some colleges that probably would be difficult to expand. There are other colleges that would be easy to expand. There are some cases like uh, 
you know, with Hanson or something, you, know, you have, a, have an old wing and you, you know, if you want to rebuild the wing, there, there, there are a whole range of possibilities. <laughs> um, what I would say is that the, the new colleges, in our thinking, the new colleges, Duncan and we're trying that as the sort of high level of the, of the size. When, when we expanded and built the new colleges, we had an extensive conversation with students. This was before I think all of you were here. And out of that conversation emerged the size of <coughs> Duncan and McMurphy. Which is not to say everybody agreed, but the, the people kind of agreed it was a reasonable compromise. So that probably sets the upper limit. My guess is that most of the college expansions would be to somewhat less than that, more like 300 instead of the 325. So we think it would be good, but it really depends on some resources in the future. It's, it's hard because when you build a new college, you can name a college and that can help you get a gift, whereas if you're just expanding the house, it would be a little harder to do that. Yeah? Uh, regarding online education, uh, do you have any plans for our own like online courseware, similar to what MIT has, or we can use edX as a pure platform to kind of propagate uh, Rice University lectures? So there are two different things, right? There's MIT has, has a courseware, and we, we have something like that. We have a platform called Connection, uh, developed by Mitch Barrow, and then we have uh, OpenStax College, right, which provides, and I don't know if any of you have ever <coughs> seen using an OpenStax uh, course, course book in what course? Uh, he likes 240. Yeah. So these are books available for free online. I think you can download them for four dollars or something, and maybe get a printed version for forty dollars or something like that. Compared to what are the unbelievable prices you can get charged for a textbook? Two hundred. Yeah. Two hundred to three hundred dollars for a textbook. Right. This is what happens to a dying industry. Right. They kind of soak all the profits while they can. And so, so we, we are fostering OpenStax College, which is the development of courseware. And then I think in terms of the platforms, what we would like to do is figure out, we have good relations right now, both with Coursera and edX. We find there's some advantages to having both of those relationships. I don't think we've developed our own platform or distribution channel, but we would like to have some role in the further development channel, including perhaps being through OpenStax, a provider of some of the textbooks for those courses. So we want to be visible. <coughs> this world, you know, um, I mean, even in your lifetime, right, you've seen such changes, right, when you don't remember, I don't think, when Amazon was only a place you went to order books, right, or for those of you who use eBay, eBay was just a place for individuals to sell stuff in auctions rather than basically a front, <coughs> kind of a storefront for lots of small businesses. Or you may or may not remember when Netflix was a business of nailing around CDs to people, <coughs> movies, and is now a business of streaming, uh, not movies, but television shows and self-produced <coughs> content. How many of you would serve it, actually? How many of you would come, if you could get uh, the head of Netflix to come to campus and talk, how many of you would come and listen? <laughs> you promise, right? <laughs> <laughs> I, ta I told him I wanted him to come to campus, so I'm going to write him and tell him I'm going to vote. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody said they would come. Right? Uh, the point that I'm making is, is if you look at all of those things, what emerged, the role of the kind of intermediary and its business model changed rather drastically. And so now we have a whole series of companies, not just edX and Coursera, but 2U and Udacity and Udemy or, you know, these are Udemy. But you have all of these different businesses in this space who are basically sitting in some ways between universities and their companies. <coughs> And this world may end up looking like that, or it may end up looking very different. But we tend to be visible. Yeah. So one of the things I noticed was missing in the SBTC, and I was just curious as to why it seems like a lot of other universities seem to make this one a priority, is sustainability and creating a more sustainable campus. And I was just kind of curious if you or Rice had plans for perhaps becoming more sustainable and perhaps in the ways that the Bay Plan is doing that. I 
I'm sorry, what's the last thing you said? Oh, I, I was wondering if there's any plans to well, become a more sustainable campus. Yeah, well, I mean, we are steadily uh, uh, moving toward being a more sustainable. Almost every building we build now, every renovation we do is, 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 a lead, is a lead certified. Uh, so we're pretty conscious of it, frankly, in, in large part because it saves cost. I was being really smart, smart about this, saves cost, and I think it is a message to our students. At the end of the day, whether you want to be carbon <coughs> neutral or something like that, whether that's possible, and what the costs are, because then costs don't just disappear. They have to be borne by somebody and taken from perhaps some other thing, and so we have to make careful decisions about that. There is, on the list of priorities, there is energy and the environment. So those two things go pretty closely hand in hand. And we intend to sort of have efforts in both of them. But I think one of the best changes we made on this campus was, was by hiring a director of sustainability, because then it becomes part of every conversation on campus, every project on campus. And so I, I suspect we'll continue to move in that direction, like other campuses, and look at what the possibilities are. So, so I, I don't know that there's some big thing or it's sort of priority one, but is it part of our thinking about almost every project has to be thought of, is and has to be thought about in that way. That's part of, you know, you really see sometimes what a difference it makes to have a piece of your organization charged with that responsibility. Uh, I assume, uh, Richard Johnson, I assume most of you, you, you got it, you know? Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, yeah. He's a, he's a rice grad. Uh, he's, I think he's done an amazing job. And he does, does a lot of that job by being a really great participant in a wide range of conversations on the campus. Yeah? Is there anything being done to promote open stack? And, and as a secondary question, like, open stack is something that's been developed by rice. Why, why, is, why is it that rice professors aren't jumping <coughs> Uh, so the first part of the question, uh, is that anything been done to promote it? I'm not the right person to ask. So I think people are finding out about it and signing up for it, and I would defer those questions to somebody else. As far as telling professors what textbooks you use for courses, good luck. <laughs> um, you know, I, I, th I think it's, I, I think as more people use it, and you know, colleagues who start doing it, and they can talk about it with their colleagues, and, but you know, if somebody's written a book that's published in the traditional manner, I'm going to use the book that they, that they wrote. I think eventually there's, their student voices are going to be heard on subjects like this, where the students are going to say, you know, X professor uses this, and it doesn't cost us very much or any money, and the book you're assigning is costing $300 a year. So, so that role is going to have to evolve. But the nature of our enterprise respects uh, the authority of the teacher in the classroom. And that includes deciding what kind of material that teacher thinks are most effective. And although the cost of textbooks is outrageous, right, it's still you know, not a huge percentage of what the overall cost is. But it's something we should keep an eye on, I mean, right? I mean, I, I assume some of you are spending close to $3,000 a year on, on materials. That's just, in my view, not appropriate. Yeah. Um, you mentioned there's a huge increase in the number of international students this year because of the higher acceptance um, of the students itself. Is there a plan to reduce that number or keep the um, Well, you know, I, we're sort of gathering information. We'd be very interested in, in hearing from folks. And you know, I want to make sure the conversation. I, I, think it's a, I think having an international student body here is a real advantage to all of us on the, on, on the campus. This is a very international world that you are very happy in, and having classmates who come from all over to me is a great advantage. We had been running before this at about 10 to 12 percent of the undergraduate student body foreign, foreign students. Uh, and that, that measures only students who acquire a visa. That's what that percentage is. So there are a lot of other folks who bring an international perspective, including students who are permanent residents of the United States. Those are additional students. Students who are dual citizens. A surprising number of those in the class. They don't count for that, in that number. For a whole bunch of reasons, including family size and financial, the, the international student group on campus has been, undergraduate, has been about half of the People's Republic of China until this year. 
This year it was over half of that student body. And so we have to kind of listen to people about their, about their experiences and, and how's it working. But probably we'd go back to a model sort of more similar to this year, but we're still in kind of listening and learning mode. One of the things we want to make sure is that we support our international students, who, who actually are pretty <coughs> wide-ranging groups from students who have a lot of experience with American culture or our, our culture. For example, it would include somebody who came, who wasn't a per permanent resident, but went to high school in the United States. They would count as an inter international student. The students who, for the first time they get off that airplane, now that you can fly direct from Beijing to Houston, that's the first time they've set foot on U.S. soil when they get off that plane. That's a pretty wide range. And so we want to make sure we're supporting those students in the most appropriate ways that we're doing all we can to kind of make sure both they have the full uh, advantage of the Rice experience and that Rice students have the full engagement with our international students as well. So, so that, that really means making sure the numbers kind of work for the student experience overall. So, you know, we'll, we'll have to see in terms of, and the other challenge is, well, we had this huge yield this, this year, will we have another huge yield next year? Or will it be different? So I think we're still examining that, and uh, I think what, one of the things we would like to have is a somewhat wider geographic distribution among the international students uh, in our population, and that means really different policies work in different countries, frankly. You know, again, one difference, almost all of our students from China are only children in their families, where if you're trying to recruit students from Mexico or India, that's not going to be the case. And that's a different kind of financial burden on them. So we're kind of looking at all that. I would say where we feel confident is we want a pretty international student body. We think having at least 10% of the student body, roughly speaking, be international is ultimately good for us to have the student body have a pretty international feel to it, uh, but we need to maintain overall balance of the student body. Okay, I'm going off the daily show. Um, <laughs> anyway, I hope uh, I want to thank uh, the SA for the opportunity. Uh, we hope, uh, shouldn't have to remind all of you, but I will, that even when you think like things are happening at Rice that you're unhappy about, think the administration's being stupid or whatever. People here, the professors, the folks in the colleges, they're here actually because they, they care about you and your experience here. And so I hope you'll just you know, make sure that we know when you think something's not as good as it could be, let us know. People, and it doesn't, it's not always true that we can find an instant fix. Sometimes if things take actually years to fix. It takes years to shift the faculty in a new direction through appointments and other things. But we want to know what will help make this the best experience. We want you going out of here thinking you got the best experience and that you would tell other folks that they should come to Rice because it is the best place to be. Thank you very much.
way around. Right? Thanks for $10. No, thanks. Thanks for $10. Thanks for $10.